All right, so good morning, everybody. It's been a, a while since I've done a meeting, um, hybrid, Zoom, and live. We have about 10 or 12 people here in Temecula, and looks like we got 20 people online. So welcome, Menifee, as well. We have a really important topic today because uh, we have some forms changes coming up um, this week. I want to first start by um, having Susan Sanderson um, say a few words as she sponsored our breakfast this morning. So thank you so much. I'm going to change this view. Do you want me stand right here? Okay. So I have to talk really fast. And <laughs> so when I talk fast, my accent comes out. So you may not understand half of what I'm saying, but I wanted to do a little something on risk management. So I have some prizes. It's everything I could find I threw in a bag. So um, <laughs> anyway. Um, I was going to ask a few questions. The first question is this. Wait a second. Okay, so in Manatee, if you're online, you guys have to unmute if you want to win, and I'll bring the prizes tomorrow. Okay, so the first question, according to NAR, what percent of homeowners are unhappy with the home that they purchased within the last year? Just start yelling out percents. Unhappy. Unhappy. 15%. Hmm? 10%. 10%. Higher than, 40, higher than 50, 60. lower 10%. than 50. 55 percent. 55, I heard 10 is way too low. <laughs> Thank you, because we got to make the time go fast. So you got to give, got to guess. Them. 55 percent, according to NAR, of homeowners are unhappy with the home that they purchased. What do you think the reason, the number one reason was for them being unhappy? Condition of the house. Right. Who said condition? Emily. Emily wins the prize. Woo! Hot dog. Okay. Thank you. The condition of the house. Now, another statistic from NAR. What percent of the population in the United States lives paycheck to paycheck? 95%. Lower. 75. 75. 75. Six, right there. I heard you say 65. Right there. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's, Sorry. You guys are all talking at the same time online, so I'm trying okay. to see who it is. Okay, so let's take those statistics. 55% of homeowners are unhappy. They're unhappy because of the condition of the home, right? And 64% of them are living paycheck to paycheck. So if something breaks down, who are they going to call? Ghostbusters. <laughs> huh? Okay, well, right there, I heard realtor, because you got to pass. I'll give this to you so you can pass it back. The realtor, right? Why are they calling the realtor? They sold the house. They sold the house. And how many people, maybe you don't do it, we know, I won't say it's you, but so many people were told, hey, let's, we have to waive all contingencies, or your offer is not going to get accepted, right? So they did not get and home inspection, a, a home warranty isn't a contingency, but it, it's a risk management tool, right? Um, so when they call the realtor and uh, the statistics for um, litigation has skyrocketed over the last couple of months, okay? They're saying, hi, Susan, um, thank you for selling me my home but the air conditioner stopped working. I have a plumbing leak, this, that, and the other thing. And my attorney said I should come to you because you're the one that told me to waive the home inspection and all my contingencies. <laughs> and this is seriously happening. This is a true, this is true, okay? And um, I was a DRE facilitator. I used to teach classes. I've seen lawsuits in court cases we, we observed. And the majority of the time, they lean towards the homeowner because you're the professional, you're the one guiding you, you're the one that's being paid, right? And guess what? You're the one that gets to pay for those repairs <laughs> <laughs> or you're, you know, however it goes. So what I want to let you know is according to NAR, home warranties are the, are the best risk management tool with legal cases to do with real estate. Okay, they really seriously are. The sellers may not want to pay for them. You may want may not want to pay for them, but let your 
buyers know they can order a warranty after they close escrow. They have 90 days with American Home Shield, okay? And if something breaks down after they move in, it's gonna be covered item as long as they're going with, you know, I recommend always the Shield Complete Plan. It's our top of the line, it includes roof, it includes unlimited coverage for refrigerant and air conditioning systems, no cap. So if we have to replace an AC system, it doesn't cap out, like you have 5,000 for the whole year, okay? All their appliances, $1,250 for code, modifications and permits, industry standards, 250. So 1,250 is huge when it comes to repairs. And it does cover washer, dryer, refrigerator, and we will rekey their home for free. She'll complete that, okay? So they don't have to pay the $85 trade call fee. We will rekey it for free. So just keep that in mind. And let's let Menifee win this one. Okay, Menifee. Oh, Mason. Well, whoever's I'm online. Whoever's online, this one is for you, okay? What company are you going to write in on all of your RPAs? <laughs> Shield. Shield. Home Shield. Home Shield. American, who is it? American Home Shield. Donna. Caesar? Okay, Caesar. All right. We got a gift for you. All so right. anyway, thank That's you. That's probably Darlene, though, I hope right? I didn't That's me, it. yes. <laughs> I'm like, I recognize the last name, not the okay. first name. <laughs> well, Caesar's going to have to give you the candy bar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. If you have any questions, don't forget the NHDs are $50. Includes code and environmental. Okay. So um, you can always get that information up front. All right. Thank you so You're much, welcome. Susan. We appreciate I won't hold up you. I know we have we really also appreciate you from our grand opening last yeah. week in Menifee. I appreciate all of Temecula who went, all of the Menifee agents who helped put it together. It was an amazing event. I wish we could have controlled the weather a little bit better, it but we couldn't. We sponsored that balloon arch. I have the name of the caterer. <laughs> I've never seen a balloon arch like that. The balloons yes. were, uh, were did amazing. A great job. So I won't hold up your music. You are not holding it up. Job. I appreciate oh, it. I appreciate you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for all your support, everybody. All right. Take care. Thank you, Susan. Bye bye. All right, so let's start. I can't start my week without knowing what good happened this week. So everybody tell me. It's been two weeks since we've had a meeting. Tell me something good. Closing escrow. Say what? All right. And that's with Prosperity Mortgage, our first one, right? Right on. So congratulations, you guys. Prosperity, first one in Temecula. And it was a very smooth transaction, right? You know what? But it makes me very much appreciate legendary escrow because this is with this was near the buyer and this other escrow is really horrible. And Let's not name names though. I won't, but, but it just, it's just like, it would have not been like this. But <laughs> <laughs> what other good news? Anybody have good news, Gay? Yes, we're closed last week. Yay! My fall home's closing tomorrow. Right on, Donna. Good job. And Adam and I have another good news that we have a, I thought when Jody was talking in that after round table yesterday that she was going to bring up ours. <laughs> Is yours a nightmare file? One. Well, we have a contingent one that's contingent, but we knew it was contingent, but I thought she was going to bring up because we could not get them to tell us when it was closing, what was going on with this other house. And finally, you know, Adam and I did the deed. We sent the note to perform and within an hour. <laughs> within an hour, they performed. That's good. <laughs> what else? Good news. We have a good open house this weekend. 38 groups through an open house this weekend. It's 873. No offer yet, but I think we'll Now, I know we had four other agents in this office. I didn't even realized you were doing one, but four other agents in the office doing open houses this last weekend and everybody had uh, traffic. So it's a good time to get going on your open houses. If you don't have open house signs, I will find some, but you should have some. Um, we have some at the office. You can borrow some of mine. I don't have very many though. So first come first serve. What else? Any other good news? Rattle. Listings are good. 
Island. Nice. We should be getting lots of listings right now. We should be. Jill finally got to go on vacation. That's why there's no listings on the board. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> well, I have some good news to share. You guys, did you, uh, did you watch the video last week? Gail and Veronica won a hundred hundred dollars for Amazon. So this will be on your guys's desk today. I promise I won't spend it first. <laughs> Congratulations on that. So speaking of Cabo, don't forget this is the last month to do your um, do your cards. So you get points for listings, of course. You get points for buyers who are qualified, uh, you know, go through prosperity for using legendary escrow, for doing things, activities like open houses are a point, coming to the meeting is a point, um, social media posts, et cetera. So get those in. They'll be due like the day after the month ends, and luckily it doesn't end on a weekend. So don't forget about that. And so let's talk about, I think we've kind of talked about listings, but does anybody want to pitch a listing or a buyer need? I'll pitch my listing in <clears throat> Burnt Valley. Okay. So my, um, the property I sold last October um, is back on the market. The buyers that bought the property um, from my seller have asked me to represent them in the sale. Um, it's three uh, residents on one lot. It's 9.78 acres. There's a two-story main house with three bedrooms, three baths, and two little cottages on the property. Um, it has a flat, a flat area in the front if you want to bring horses or what have you there. Um, it's fenced all the way around. It's listed at 728. 728,000 for the three houses, all built with permits. The funny part though, is it's called Burnt Valley and, and it burnt down. No, it didn't burn all the way down, but it burned, right? <laughs> yeah. they, had a, they had a structure, they had a structure on the property, an illegal structure that caught fire. So that has been removed and wiring has put black in place according to code. <laughs> I wonder what they were doing way out there in nowhere. <laughs> oh, your son lives out there? It's just right. <laughs> they were growing up there. Okay, what else? What else? Jill? Nice. Two bedroom, two bath, 1200 square feet, single story. What is it? Three? 3398. What else? Anybody else? Shannon, where is the property located? Hemet. 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 Is it, is it um, senior, Jill? No. No. It's a uh, regular residential. Okay, Capri, speak up. I still have the 2300 square foot. 599 home in Winchester. The people are moving out this weekend. I'll be doing some staging and it's open for openness anytime. Oh, open house opportunity. Okay. After this weekend. After this weekend. Right on. Anybody else? Six ninety nine. Okay. Anybody else? Um, my meadow view listing. I'll throw it out there. Um, just over twenty six hundred square feet on um, 
a little under three quarters of an acre, great views, RV potential, three bedroom, two bath, single story, plus an office, and we're at 873. It's unheard of in Meadowview, 873. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on. Let's talk about um, our local market update for the last seven days. So we didn't have a meeting last week. So this is truly just the last seven days. We have um, 229 new listings in our Temecula Valley, which is seven cities, including Menifee. Um, 249 went into escrow in the last week, 185 sold. Um, Menifee has a total active count um, coming soon and active of 262, the lowest price being 300,000. And the Temecula has 930, sorry, Temecula only, Temecula City is 551,000 is the lowest price, um, 223 listings. And in all of the Temecula Valley, all seven cities, 931 active single family homes. Riverside County is almost climbing too high that I can't track it anymore. So 3,990 with a plus behind it, whatever that means, however many more on the MLS. Oh, goodness. And then um, Temecula Valley price changes, 214 price changes in one week, mostly down. So I'm not saying that we should all panic. We're just normalizing and um, things are taking a little longer. Sellers are starting to panic a little bit, but they shouldn't, you know, just go out there, get those listings. Um, let's try to market them at the right price. But if the seller says, no, I want to go 50,000 higher, maybe you should take it because guess what? You're going to get some advertising out, out of it. You're going to get your stick in the dirt and you're going to be able to do some marketing on social media and um, send out postcards and things like that. But um, try to get them at the right price so we can sell them a little quicker. So what else is happening? I saw this in the news today. Redfin I saw last week. Um, Compass I just saw today that they're laying off workers. And so when you don't have a good real estate model, things start falling apart when the market starts changing. And some of you remember Purple Bricks who are gone now and um, Redfin, they don't have a great model for keeping their money in their own pocket because they give it away back to the sellers. So I just like to bring up this slide. Um, kind of shows all the other competitors of ours and their market values. And I know this slide is a couple of weeks old, but showing Redfin is down 80%, Compass is down 75%. But look at Berkshire Hathaway. We know how to manage our money. So we're not going anywhere, 35% up. <clears throat> now the fun part. All right. So I have six pages of um, forms that are either changing or are brand new starting next week. So um, I have it on the side here. I have to read, I can't read the screen. So I'm only gonna talk about the ones that are going to actually affect us. So let's start with a new form, which is called the Designated Electronic Delivery Address Amendment. And I'm going to get to the actual place in the contract or the, I'll show you the new contract, but it's basically, you know how we put in our email addresses right now and where do we send documents to to confirm you received it? Well, if you forget to do that, this is a new form so that you can say, oh, here's the new form. So here's where my email address is. The other new form is a Fair Appraisal Act addendum, and it's going to be included in the RPA package and the listing agreement package as one of those top forms. So, you know, we have the agency, we have the wire fraud, all of those, so this will be a new one. I'll show you what it looks like. They didn't wanna modify the RPA again to include the language because it was too much. All right, so the next one is <laughs> non-standard forms advisory form. Okay, a brand new form again. It's basically just telling the principal that if, um, if they are using non-realtor forms, they should consult an attorney before proceeding with the transaction. And we don't usually use non-DRE forms, so not a problem. The only time we see those are like affiliated business, but sometimes you'll see some disclosures come from certain brokerages. So just... Yeah, it could be, could be. Yeah, for sure. If, if you're, yeah, good question. 
Yeah, but um, we've done a couple deals with Zillow and they have their own contract. So even though we have read it, the client should be consulting that contract with an attorney because it's not our contract. We're not familiar with it. So then the next one is the cancellation of contract had a change. This is a change for the good. So the change is um, where we have a situation where escrow needs to be canceled, but there's no deposit. Finally, we have a checkbox that says we're canceling escrow. There's no deposit check because we used to just be like, what do we do? Write it in, right? So that's a great change. Contingency for the sale of buyer's property. Um, a reminder was added to the bottom of the page, um, page two, that the COP form itself can be used by the seller to give notice to the buyer to remove that contingency. Pretty easy. So you don't have to use a notice to buyer to perform. You just use that form, give it to the buyer. I'm giving you notice right now. Okay. Um, fair housing and discrimination advisory. Let me move my screen. Um, they just added genetic information to that. Just super easy change. You're going to love the next one. Fire hardening defensible space advisory. As if we have not beat that form <laughs> to death, they are made a huge change. <laughs> and luckily for us, I have our favorite NHD company, my NHD coming in two weeks. So we will dive into it again, but I'll show you um, the red line. It's a lot. There's a lot of red lines on that one. I like have the whole thing highlighted. All right, next page. So the RPA did have a couple of changes, but they're very easy. They just added a paragraph that referenced the Fair Appraisal Act addendum, just saying you kind of like the ones that we have that say the agencies attached, um, wire frauds attached. It's probably like that, and I'll show it to you. The residential listing agreement, um, lease after sale and lease agreements, they all were modified to remove um, the prevailing party language and replace it with payment of their own attorney fees. That's for um, damages, of course. And the signature block um, was modified to allow for ent entity signatures like the new RPA has, which will be a blessing. That means we don't have to use the RCSD when we take an RLA, if you do it right. If not, Sean is gonna so I'm just going to crack the whip and say, nope, you made the, the other form. Um, <clears throat> the request for repairs and the RRRR um, was modified to allow the seller to require the buyer to sign the contingency removal. And the SBSA was modified to advise the need to read their documents. <laughs> I'm not going to read it. <laughs> Read the documents in their entirety, even if they're signing electronically. And, they, and they won't read it because they're signing electronically. So let's just advise that. <laughs> the seller license to remain in possession. This form I absolutely hate these days because we're using it so much and there's a lot of problems with it. But um, basically there's warning language to the buyer that if the possession exceeds 29 days, they recommend um, the 29 day limit, I should say, um, an attorney should be consulted as a landlord tenant relationship could be established after the 29th day. Then we have problems. Um, and paragraph five was modified to prohibit a buyer from moving personal property into the property during the seller's possession. So unless you guys have an agreement, of course, where the buyer maybe can move their stuff into the garage, but otherwise the buyer's not supposed to move their stuff in until the seller's out. <clears throat> the seller property questionnaire, um, there was more explicit language that a yes answer should be provided regardless of how long an asked about event occurred. Don't we always get this question? I've lived there for 30 years. How far back do I have to disclose? Forever, forever. And that's what this is saying. Paragraph 6A addresses the optional disclosure of the manner of death in addition to the death itself. So that's new. And remember, we can't disclose if it was HIV AIDS, but now it's asking how they died. So Shannon? Yep. Shannon. At home, uh, we're only on page 13. I don't know if anybody else is experiencing that. Okay. 
You should be on the same page now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for the heads up. Are, and are then, they gonna give us guidance on what works? Um, there was a video. Can we say natural causes for everything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. They I. were murdered. <laughs> so there was actually. <laughs> Well, <laughs> suicide is, yeah. Anyway, but the thing is, is that there was actually a um, webinar yesterday on CAR's website on all these changes. I didn't get to catch it, but the recording's there. So I'm sure they discussed that. And uh, I'll send you the link so you guys can all go back. But the, the secondary thing on the SPQ is a question was added on 18B for changes made to the property due to cannabis cultivation. So, <laughs> where's Donna? Where's Donna? <laughs> the good news. I heard that. <laughs> you know when we went through the, the walkthrough, the, the DP, there was probably at least easily two hundred pounds of marijuana. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, so the, the thing is, is whenever we have a change, if you're already in escrow and you have your form filled out, you can still use the old form. But this is interesting. This will come out next week and it will be it will land in your zip forms and you won't have the old one. Um, there's only three more, a tenant occupied property addendum. I know when we do a residential lease after sale, this addendum shows up and everybody's like, why is it showing me this rent cap? and stuff like that. And so there's just a modification to say that the rent cap and just cause addendum is just for informational purposes. Doesn't mean it actually applies. The vacant land purchase agreement and joint escrow instructions just added the Fair Appraisal Act addendum and the wildfire uh, disaster advisory form. Um, they, the language that they removed from the FHDS was added to this form. So let me show you. <laughs> Let me show you the forms now so you can kind of see. And I, I'll try to not go in too, pa too far past um, our normal meeting time. But OK, is everybody seeing that yes. that's on Zoom? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes, OK, so are. this yes. this is the um, residential purchase agreement. And it's basically just I'm, it's just outlined the delivery um, information. It's already, this part's already on there, but the part that has, is that we're referencing is this designated electronic delivery address. So if you don't fill this in when you're writing the contract, then you're going to use this new form to add it in. Simple as that. So is the old form June 2022 and this is June 2022? No. So the old form is the purchase agreement um, and that's last year's. And this one is no. Oh, so you just if you don't fill it if out, you miss it, if yeah. you miss it, we want to add a whole nother page to your contract. <laughs> but, but do you? I mean, what if you just don't want to do it? <laughs> well, do you want to get your documents? I don't know. I mean, yeah, but um, <laughs> but do I, wanna, I mean, they always just send it to the last email they got from. You. I know, they but this is it. technically what this does is if you put your email address in there then when they send it to that exact email address, it's deemed delivered immediately. It's not like I have to wait three days now where we didn't have that before. So if you, on the other side, if they don't do it and you want that, you can ask. Yeah, okay. yeah. In this form. And you probably, yeah, you'd have to do it on this form. Okay. okay. So this is the RPA as well, um, seller remaining in possession. And it just talks about that buyer advised to consult with the buyer's lender about the impact of the occupancy on the buyer's loan. Remember, you do need to talk to the lender if the um, seller is going to stay there because the buyer has to occupy after a certain number of days. And it really depends on their loan. And then there's that Fair Appraisal Act. What does that say? It says um, the parties acknowledge receipt of the attached Fair Appraisal Act addendum, which is right there. And this basically addendum happened because when we were um, having appraisals done, some of the appraisers were biased. They were not following fair housing guidelines. And um, we were noticing that appraisals were coming low in certain cases, which is bad. 
So, I mean, great for us, the lenders and appraisers don't see this one, but there is a place, there is a solution on here. If the seller or the buyer feel like they didn't get a fair appraisal, there's actually a phone number that they can call. So. Shannon, would that take in place then of you doing um, a rebuttal? Or is that I don't just think so. a resource that they could do on behalf of themselves? Yes, so, yeah. I don't think it will take the place of a rebuttal. That's a very good question. It does say go to the lender first, but in my opinion, I think the lender will be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I think they should go direct to the source. So a rebuttal is when um, you elevate the appraisal. Right, because it came in low, so you're gonna challenge it. Okay. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you might get only $500. Five, five, <laughs> I was gonna say 5,000. <laughs> Okay, so this is the additional broker acknowledgement. I didn't really talk about this, but you can see there's broker one, broker two. We don't usually do um, deals with outside brokers, but just know that it is possible. Um, cancellation of contract, you'll see um, there's some clarification on line 1A, one party cancellation, and it's always been a single party cancellation buyer or seller cancels, not both. Um, so it's, it's clarifying this and then um, there is a proposed mutual cancellation. If it's a mutual cancellation, then all parties sign. If it's single party compensation, as always, one party signs, whoever the canceling party is. And then here's the section where it talks about the deposit. There's now a number four that says there's no deposit in escrow. Yay. You guys can speak up. I know you're speaking up already, Ben. Anybody out there? So that's that would be the three, you know, before the three day. Like you get yeah, or they never performed, so okay. the seller's canceling. Um, contingency for sale of buyer's property form. Here's that section that talks about um, the seller using the bottom of this page two to notify the buyer to remove this contingency, and here is what it looks like. Not going to read it to you. Oh, here's the fire hardening. Look at all that red. Okay, so um, some of this has language has been moved to the wildfire advisory form, which we don't use as much as this one. But let's just, I want to read just the first paragraph because it kind of, I, I know some of our agents are using this form where they don't have to be. So um, the fire hardening disclosure section, which is below this first paragraph, it says the notice and disclosure of vulnerabilities in paragraph two are only required for sellers of residential properties if the property contains one to four units, always happens. The seller is required to complete a real estate transfer disclosure statement, almost always happens. Um, the property is located in either a high or very high fire severity zone. Sometimes that happens. And number four, Lost my spot. The improvements on the property were constructed before January 1st, 2010. 2010. So if we have newer properties, they do not have to do section two. Okay. So if all of those conditions are met, you do not have to do section two. So like I said, we're going to dive into this again when my NHD is here. Um, but here's the defensible space disclosure and addendum. And the default, as it was before, is that the buyer, it's the buyer's responsibility. And then there are other options. And that's only if there's local ordinances. And I'm not, it's too much. It's a whole two hour class on it again. So I'm not going there. <clears throat> so quiet. But it is. <laughs> If you feel uncomfortable to have your client to sign just all of it, just to have the disclosures. Well, the, the one thing about the fire hardening disclosure is even though it says it's a disclosure, it's required to be with the contract. So the buyer's agent could send it with the offer, but the seller should definitely counter it and add it in immediately because it's talking about something that could cost the buyer money if they had to do some kind of um, changes to the property. So something to think about. I don't think I've ever seen it countered in yet. 
Uh, I think we just use it as a disclosure and that's not the proper way. So, okay, residential listing agreement. Um, this is the dispute resolution um, section where it basically says uh, each party pays their own during mediation. And that this is, remember this is the listing. So this is the broker and the seller. And then this is the um, request, the RRRR. So uh, wow. there's the pirate form. <laughs> um, so it's been modified. We're almost done. And seller response, oh, that's the RRRR. Um, so it's just talking about um, delivering the conditions. And you guys can all send all the forms with the red line so you can read them all yourself after this. Um, buyer tenant not agency. So it's talking about confirmation of compliance. Oh, so non-agency, we don't do this very often either. A non-agency agreement, it would be like, um, if you're working with a buyer and maybe they they want to buy your listing, but they don't want to be represented, so we would do a non-agency agreement. So that's what this is. Doesn't usually happen. It's not usual. And then there's a seller non-agency agreement. Seller non-agency more likely if we have a for sale by owner that does not want to be represented. Are these also for leases? If you have, you know, yeah. so if you're leasing and the tenant doesn't. Um, it could be, let me see. Yeah, seller or landlord and it's probably buyer or tenant. Mm -hmm. And then this is, um, this is just the RPA again, it's just talking about how they added now the probate agreement purchase addendum on because it wasn't there before. And then here's the probate um, purchase agreement. It's been modified a lot. We don't do a lot of these, so I'm not gonna read through that. If you decide to do probate though, there is a wonderful CAR class. I believe it's an all day class that I recommend you do before you even try, because it's a lot of information. And that has to do with taking a listing. Probate. Yes, listing and probate. Buyer side's pretty easy. Okay, and the SBSA, Really good. <laughs> okay, so there's a, a new notice notice about sea level and rise on the coastal properties, and then um, <laughs> signing documents electronically. Please read. And they did put the move the liquidated damages mediation or arbitration to um, kind of go along with the RPA. So they go in order of the RPA. So that's why they're all red. It's just they move them around on the SBSA. That's the second part. Okay. License to remain. That's just the advisory to say, hey, if you go longer than 29 days, talk to an attorney. And then um, buyer don't keep your property there until you actually move in. And, oh, and if you extend it, then you're also possible landlord attorney situation. And then the multiple counter offer, I think it has something to do with keeping a backup offer. And we don't usually do um, like backup offers formally, but there is a formal backup offer form to say you're in line number one you're in position number two. So you could read that. Um, this is the S SPQ and it's just emphasizing the are you aware and it goes all the way back in time. And here's the death on the property. So if you mark yes, note to seller, the manner of death may be a material fact to the buyer and should be disclosed. So if you don't disclose anything, then you know the person died of AIDS. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of, I, I know that's exactly what I thought too. Because I'm like, they, it just says it may be a material fact and it should be disclosed, lawyer language. Um, so it's, I guess it would be up to the seller if they feel like they want to disclose it on a document. The neighbors are going to well, say, just, anyway. You can't say it was You can say it was a medical yeah, that's true. That's a good point. But the neighbors are going to tell them. Yeah, exactly. 
All right. Um, that doesn't happen that often anymore. Right. No, it's true. Disaster relief changes, uh, HOA, CC, and R's. Um, so they did add some language in here regarding the CC and R's deed restrictions and stuff like that. So pay attention to that. You guys should definitely read this whole form with those red line sections. And then ownership. Um, again, talking about common walls, common um, spaces that they share. And then this is the tenant occupied property addendum. Remember this document is supposed to be used if the tenant or somebody is gonna be on the property um, after close of escrow. And then it has that, um, it has that other form. And then this is the wildfire disaster advisory. The stuff that was taken off the um, fire hardening disclosure has been moved to here. That's it, holy moly, okay. That's it for forms. Um, so I'm gonna send you the red line um, forms so that you can actually read them yourself. Let me change my screen again. So are there any, so there's a link here, I'll put it in the email as well separately. So let's talk about what's coming up as far as training. Um, Chris has some great training classes. You know, the calendar online always shows you where they're at, but, Chris is coming to Temecula next week Yay. and he'll be here live. So if you want to come to the training that's already scheduled, he'll be doing that from nine to noon and then one-on-one -on -one appointments, which you have to schedule with him directly. And then we also have Rick Therabee coming to the Menifee office next week. He's gonna be talking about how to thrive in a changing real estate market, the one that we're in right now. Live class lunch will be included. And I just like, I always like to acknowledge our um, vendors. So Prosperity Mortgage, he's not here. Legendary Escrow, we had a great class yesterday and um, Orange Coast Title. So, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of a, I'm hoping you can do it some time because we worked our way through it. But, right, so this one escrow that I will leave off the name of who it is that we have trouble with. And we had trouble the whole escrow, getting a hold of this escrow office. She, the form they would send, there was like one phone number. And she, on her email signature, she had one phone number. But sometimes that phone number had an extension and sometimes it didn't. And whenever our client needed to talk to escrow, they had trouble getting a hold of them. And it would not, it would like ring through and then go to their voice, like to an operator. And sometimes we go to the Glendale office. Sometimes we go to the San Diego office and they kept saying, she doesn't work in this office and they <laughs> couldn't forward it to her. And, and so, you know, we would tackle and get, and she'd go, well, email me, I'll answer quick. Well, here was the problem. We came to, she, they needed to wire in, the, do the wire transfer. And oh, and this was the other thing. She's sending wire instructions and it says, and my, my client calls and says, it says on here, if this is from an unsecured email, don't delete this, you know, in contact <laughs> the escrow officer. Yeah. And it was, it was just wire instructions on an unsecured email. And, you know, kind of went to a bunch of people, you know, which normally it just goes to the person. And, um, call, and he calls her and she says, oh, I just have to put that disclosure on my email. I don't ever send secure emails. Oh my gosh. And um, so then we're going to do the wire and it's from American Express, you know, it's not a region big company, American Express is wiring in the money. And they're telling our client, um, this phone number that I have to call to confirm with the escrow is not connected to this escrow. And we cannot talk to, to a like basically a made up number. You well, know, it has a number for like a wet fire screen. They have to verify that it's a number connected to that actual escrow. Wow. Oh my gosh. And so we went back and forth. The escrow officer's like, this is this is my number. This is what I use. You know, like, and so um but it wasn't a number that was published. So the right. wire people wiring did not want to wire because right. they couldn't so see they it. Said, well, you have to give me your main office and they have to be able to connect me to you. And, and, they, and she says, well, I don't work in the office, I'm remote. And they're like, well, they have to go to connect you. They go, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna, you say you're in the San Diego office, we'll call it, hopefully they connect us. And they actually went on a three-way call with everybody. 
you know, we don't really know that that's off of her. You know, so it could have been someone spoofing it all along because we had so much trouble getting a hold of her. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so finally it went through. But that is, I mean, I don't know what else we could have done. So it's kind of a question and also just a warning. If you're having trouble, you could have trouble right at the last minute with the flyer. And I mean, it's just kind of crazy that. She was making fun of this wire fraud issue, which is a real thing. That's not good. We've had a, an increase in wire fraud, um, according to Darren. Last week, he mentioned it. Yeah. So I don't know that there was much more you can do. The three-way call was an excellent idea. Um, and beyond that, I you might have to get a supervisor involved and say the supervisor needs to confirm this then. And, well, and actually, they need to be at the corporate office. They had, to do. they had to get someone, when they called the San Diego office, they said, you know, basically, American Express said they you have to confirm these escrow instructions for us because you can't get a hold of the right person. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, I'm glad you got it figured out. Yeah, <laughs> another reason to use legendary escrow. <laughs> Write them in. That, that's why I said legendary is so wonderful. <laughs> All right, something I wanted to share with you guys. Um, last week we had a a video webinar with the entire company. It wasn't very well attended, in my opinion. You know, we got over 3,000 agents and only 200 agents show up to the seminar. And um, so it was Jimmy Burgess. He's the CEO of Berkshire Hath Hathaway Beach Properties in Florida. And he had seven ways to basically gain some new listings. And the first way was amazing. So I want to share with you um, what he calls an unsolicited video CMA. And he said he did these for a couple of months in a row. He did like 70 of them. And um, it increased his business significantly. Now, the replay of the whole video of his seven steps came back to you guys on Friday, I believe. So rewatch it. But I want to show you the actual um, unsolicited video that he has sent to a client. So hang on a sec. And are we going to have a copy of that as well? It's in your email right now. And that, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. It showed up right before I started the meeting. So. So are you guys seeing this where it says a day, a day go online, Cecily? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let me play this. Hey, Carrie. It's Jimmy Burgess with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services down at the beach. Just want to check in with you guys. I hope you had a great summer. I've uh, been about six months since I let you know kind of an update on where we are and where your condo's value is. So just want to give you a quick brief update on kind of where we are with everything, what's happening right now, and get you a little better deal. I know <clears throat> you know this, but I just kind of want to go through it. As, as you know, it just goes, this is Adagio here, A, building A, building B, building C, D, E, F, obviously where yours is and in G. So um, let me kind of go through some of these things, some of these sales that have happened recently um, that have come on the market and the, and the lack of activity actually in condos like yours. Now we know, so what I did is, is I pulled up all the sales for the last couple of years to get us a basis on where those sales have been. And in reality, we have not had a single place. Uh, we've only had one place sell in the last year and it was the one that sold for um, $720, um, and that sold in, I believe it was September. Let me look this up real quick and show you exactly when this one sold. Uh, this one sold in September 28th of last year, so coming up on a year uh, since that last sale. Um, and when we go back over here uh, to this list, let me move this around just a little bit. When we go back over here to this list, you can see that's the only one that sold in the last year. These others were sales that you're probably familiar with that happened previously. 725, 725, 740, and 755. What happened when we had the 755 price move, which was a pretty substantial move from where we had been in that low 700s, uh, we saw a good bit of them come on the market. As you can see right now, we've got a few that are for sale. This one just came on the market this past like two days ago. Uh, and this is a first floor unit in building E, so across from you, 103 for 745,000. Uh, to be perfectly frank, it's, pr it's priced really good. I don't expect that one to last long. But we have had this one sitting here, F or E304 at, at 755, D203 at 764.9, E302, 769. That one's been on and off the market for a long time. Um, F302, so right above you, 
uh, at 769. And then F303, again, just right above you and one over at 769 also. Um, and those are the those are the three bedroom places that are available. Um, what this is telling us is a couple of things. I'm gonna give you a general outlook on what we're seeing overall in the market. If we just take the full residential market along Highway 30A, what we've been seeing this year is, is year over year, uh, we are basically flat. Uh, we are about flat on the number of transactions. We're flat on the on the average price per square foot, and the average price is within a thousand dollars right now of what it was last year. Um, so we have seen a really really flat market and a flattening of our market that was very consistent in its 5.4 to 7 percent average move up over the last three to four years. So this is a little bit of a flattening of where we are. We're probably at a place where. Uh, the market is trying to figure out which direction to go. Uh, whereas we were seeing that steady growth, we've seen it for eight years now. Uh, we may be getting to a place now where uh, we're seeing a little bit of a pullback um, and maybe this is just a pause to jump. So this is where we are right now. The good news is, is probably based on everything with your place, you're probably in the value somewhere between the 745 and 760 right now. I haven't been in there to see if you guys have done anything new, uh, but obviously yours was in extremely good shape back then and I'm assuming it still is. So um, we're up roughly $100,000 from when you purchased it. Uh, so we're in good shape there, but just kind of wanted to bring it up to speed. Also, I know that you guys had talked about at one time moving up to one of the Gulf Front units. And if we're looking at these, now this is a different different deal. You, you're going to see a ton of activity here. If you'll notice, there are three of these under contract right now. We've had two of these sell this year. And then we've got just a few that are for sale. We've got one, two, three, four, five of these for sale right now. So the market is absorbing these pretty well right now when they come on the market. If you guys are still thinking about that and wanted to kind of get a better feel for that, want me to go over and just do a quick video walkthrough or get on, um, get on FaceTime with you and let you see one virtually. I'd be glad to do that. Again, I hope you guys are doing well. No one here if I can do anything. i uh, love to be you guys, your resource down here. And uh, just let me know if there's anything at all. Talk to you guys soon. All right. So what did you guys think about that? I think this was brilliant. I um, Because this was sent to his sphere of influence, his past clients, um, people that were in his database that knew him and unsolicited, just sent to the email. And he, what he found was that if they didn't watch it right away, they would, they would find it again in their email and go back and watch it. And he's basically just talking to a screen. So this is something you could practice and send it out. All he had was his MLS up there and going over comps and he did it at his own time, at his own speed. You guys could so do this, right? Erica, you're gonna do it. I love it. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you're afraid of doing it, you know, you get to practice. It's not like uh, you're not live with the customer. Just do it on Zoom. It's very easy to just put yourself in the corner and then share your screen on the MLS. I want to challenge you guys to try to do a couple of these and tell me how it goes. Because um, you can look, if you post them on YouTube and you make them private, you can see when they're viewed. Not the time of day they're viewed, but how often they're viewed. So if you don't go view it yourself, every view will be the customer that it was sent to privately. So something to think about. Um, the act, like I said, the actual um, original training was last Thursday and you have a copy in your email. And this email came out just before the meeting started. And one of our managers from Arizona, Todd, Todd, I don't remember his last name, um, showed you how to put it together. So um, there's no excuses. So if you do one though, send it to me. <laughs> I wanna see it. Um, I, say, I say you sound like Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, he does? Because he's from Florida with the accent. Anyway, so um, that's all I have for today. We are going to, in Temecula, we do, um, Joker jackpot. Um, so we're going to do Joker jackpot right now. So Menifee, maybe you guys should get this going too. It would be a lot of fun. So Joker jackpot. We're all gamblers and drinkers here. So dollar and a business card every time you want to play goes into the bag that Shauna has, who's going to come stand in front of the screen. And um, so we're going to draw for who gets to try to draw a Joker. If you draw the joker, you get to win the prize for the day. How's the price right now? 30. Only $30 because we already gave it away. We gave away two prizes in the last couple of months, 170 or something. Yeah. 
So who's going to draw? Who's going to draw? Okay, so we're just drawing a card, a business card that is, out of a bag of people who paid a dollar. And you have to be present to win. You have to be present Adrian. either. Adrian. So you have to be present to win. So if Adrian wasn't here, we'd throw her card away and pick somebody else out. Okay, so now we have a deck of cards and we only have two jokers in here and it's pretty thick still because we just started again. So good luck. Try to draw the joker. I'm gonna try. <laughs> I know you're always correcting me. <laughs> I can cheat and look, but I won't. You're taller than me. Ah, I think I drew a king. The you did draw time. a king. Okay, so she drew a king. The king does not go back in the pot. So we're gonna try again next week, and the pot will grow. Yeah. All right. Any other um, questions or announcements that anybody wants to make? Anybody? Okay, then that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining live and online. I will share this. Um, I will share this so that you guys can watch it again if you want to hear my comments. Otherwise, have a wonderful